Uh, <clears throat> thanks so much, uh, Jesse, for the introduction. It's a real pleasure to give this lecture before the AGM of the Regional Studies Association. I'm only sorry that it can't be in person, and it's, uh, but of course, this means it's more accessible to, to a lot of people. Uh, the topic that I'm addressing today is certainly a hot one at the moment, particularly in, in uh, Britain and in the United States. And in my allotted time, I certainly can't do it uh, justice. In trying, I may be guilty of, of, uh, of what, what in English parlance is called over-egging the pudding, as Andy Lation uh, once put it in an accurate review of a book I co-authored, you know, which is trying to do too much at once. Um, now, there are many excellent reviews and discussions of the implications of the idea of the geographical leveling up of national economies as expressed in, in recent years uh, in the UK and US. From the Brookings Institution in the United States to the Bennett Institute at Cambridge in the, in the UK, by way of the writing of Diane Coyle and Christina Beatty and Steve Fothergill, just to name a few, um, there's, a, there's been a, a tr tremendous amount of, of, of interest uh, in, in this topic. And of course, partly in response to political initiatives of one sort or another. And there is, of course, a long-standing literature represented in the initiatives and publications of the RSA that speak to the challenges in question. In that just this year, I've read articles by Danny McKinnon, John Harrison, and Michael Kenny that look at the question uh, from governmental strategic, uh, business, and political perspectives in innovative and enlightening ways. I want to take a somewhat different tack by looking at the what I call the regional imaginations at work in recent proposals um, to compensate places that are described as having been left behind, as this language tends to have it, by recent economic trends. Maybe uh, Alex could look at the first, the first slide. Yeah, maybe the maybe the second the second one now uh, quickly. Okay, so the focus uh, here then is on this political debate and the, and the rhetoric currently in, particularly in the UK and the US concerning compensating places left behind, presumably as a result of the impact of globalization. And, and so this is the, the focus of what I wanna say today. So I'm drawing here, if somewhat haphazardly on writing I've done previously uh, in 2000, for example, in a, in a paper in Progress in Human Geography, and in 2013, in a paper in regional studies called Arguing with Regions on understandings of regions and their relevance uh, for economic development, I emphasized uh, uh, three things, uneven development in a multi-scalar context, rather than regions just as containers, uh, global city regions, and the historical mutability of regional shapes as necessary for real understanding. Uh, I think we'll see that none of these considerations seems to um, be behind many of the current proposals for leveling up. So I'm gonna go through seven themes. If you look at the next uh, slide, uh, very briefly, of course, trying to zip through them as quickly as possible. And I wanna use images to illustrate the points uh, that I'm making. I hope that at the end, the whole will appear to be somewhat greater uh, than the sum of the parts. And so I wanna start with the idea of what often is meant when we talk about regions um, and the language used. Uh, maybe we could turn to the uh, next slide for this. Well, wh what do we mean when we talk about regions in terms of leveling, leveling up and so on? I mean, typically in Britain, it's the, the idea of a struggling North versus a rich South. Uh, in the United States, uh, maybe the next uh, slide, it's the uh, no, that's one I borrowed from Sally. You know, it's grim up north, it, it says here, which I think is kind of the, the vision that, you know, uh, politicians who come from Surrey uh, tend to have of the, of the north of England. Um, this reminds me, this one, of a friend I had when I was an undergraduate at the University of Exeter as a kind of uh, exiled northerner in the southwest of England who thought he had a winning claim when he said the north begins at Potter's Bar. You know, which of course is, you know, uh, on the, as you leave Euston Station, it, 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 it appears very quickly. Uh, so the North was everything else. Uh, maybe we can move on to the next, uh, the next slide. 
Uh, in the United States, the language is very much of a, a falling behind former manufacturing belt in the Midwest, and then parts of the South, uh, which in many ways have, have, have been in a kind of a perpetual condition of stasis for, for, for many years, um, versus the multicultural, uh, globalizing, globalist coasts like the Northeast um, and the West Coast in particular. Um, and so a lot of the discussions in terms of these really quite gross uh, conceptions of regions, these large areas in, in which things are uh, regarded as, as being uh, rather uh, homogenous. Let's, let's move, move along to the next uh, one here. But this isn't to say that there isn't some kind of regional problem. There is a regional problem, uh, that, it, that, that somehow these are just um, vague uh, uh, allusions to particular regions where, where somehow everything is, um, is in decline or, or in stagnation. Um, and this is the typical kind of way in which it gets represented. This is, of course, from The Economist magazine showing how over the uh, recent past, um, some regions have got richer and, and others uh, stayed the same or got poorer. And, and Britain in particular uh, often appears uh, very poorly on these comparisons. Uh, but the United States and many other countries are not very, very far behind. And so the idea here is that there's a, there's a potential here, both for improving the lives of people who live in the poorer regions by somehow leveling them up, uh, but also that everyone collectively will be better off as a result of this. We could go to the next uh, one. Um, part of the problem here is the focus is overwhelmingly on unweighted differences between regions, like in that last uh, slide there, as containers in gross domestic product per capita. Yet when we put in cost of living differences, and this is done here for uh, the case of Britain, well, actually, it's done for the case of, this is for England and Wales, actually, not for Scotland and Northern Ireland. When the cost of living is included, uh, the differences are much less. They shrink as you uh, move over here. So from gross value added per hour worked on the, on the left side here to median household income after housing costs on the other side, there's a, there's a really quite a significant shrinkage in the differences between uh, the richest regions anyway on the one hand and the, and the median, if you like, on the other. Um, let's take a look at the next uh, slide because the next one shows what may be in fact a much bigger problem, which is aging populations. These may be more of a long-term problem with forecasts of the, here the percentage of the population over the age of 65, suggesting that many places will face problems in recruiting workers unless they can bring people back who've left or attract immigrants from elsewhere. So this is, these are population projections. Uh, the, the darkest area on the right there are where 30 to 42 percent of, uh, of a district's population uh, will be over the age of 65 in 2039. So that, they're going to be very difficult places to attract any kind of uh, business to, uh, given this kind of dem uh, demography. So, so this, is, this may be an, an, a much bigger barrier than, than just the question of gross value added or, or GDP per capita. Okay, moving, moving on to the, to the third theme then. One of the things that seems to be generating a lot of the concern with leveling up, uh, particularly in, in the UK and the, and, and the US, is really the nature of their electoral systems. You know, in many other countries, uh, you know, I know Italy and, 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 and Germany reasonably well, uh, the question there is often very much just a question of, of economic uh, processes that can help bring about some kind of uh, reduction in, um, in uh, disparities between regions. Uh, one of the features of both Britain and the United States that they have in common are these uh, majoritarian uh, first-past-the-post elections. And so there's a tendency here to think very much in terms of electoral districts or constituencies as the basic kind of units in which you're uh, concerned with. And, and in fact, that's been the context in which a lot of the recent discussion of leveling up has come has occurred in, in Britain very much in trying to attract voters um, in the north of England to the Conservative Party and in the United States trying to attract um, voters uh, to the Republican Party. These are, ironically, these, uh, these are the two parties that have been most involved in, in picking up on the theme of places or regions that have been left behind, rather than traditionally, the, the, in, in the British case, the Labour Party or in the um, 
American case, the Democratic Party, who, who talk very much about uh, sort of demographic inequalities between uh, uh, cl social classes or, or, um, or um, uh, ethnic groups, um, but tend not to talk so much about geographic differences. And I think this focus on geographic differences is at least in part inspired by, by the whole electoral calculus uh, behind um, uh, the, this notion of, of, of trying to level up. And you can see here, I mean, in, in Britain, it's well known that there's a very quite high correlation, especially in England, uh, between uh, areas that voted for Brexit on the one hand, and then in, in so-called declining industrial areas, and then the vote for the conservatives in, in the recent elections, especially in, in 2019. Uh, maybe take a look at the next one. And, and the same thing goes in, in, the, in the US. Here we have this is an interesting map, at least uh, for those of us who are interested in electoral cephology. Uh, this one shows the, uh, the, the, the swing from uh, the vote for Mitt Romney in, in 2012 to the vote for Donald Trump in 2016. So the darker areas on this map here, the redder areas are the ones where there was a significant swing uh, from, from people voting for Romney for president as a kind of more traditional Republican and then for Donald Trump in 2016. And, and this vote is heavily concentrated in the former manufacturing belt in the Midwest, um, and to a certain extent, of course, also in the prairies um, in North Dakota, South Dakota. But, but particularly uh, interesting here are in areas uh, where uh, unemployment rates have gone up at the same time that manufacturing employment has gone down. So, so this again is in, uh, you know, in a sense, a kind of measure of the degree to which a candidate like Trump was successful in attracting so-called uh, left behind voters, people with a sense that the areas that they were living in had, had sort of lost their, uh, lost their economic uh, path, if you like. So, uh, so, so because elections are decided then on a majoritarian basis um, in, in both countries, this tends to lead to an emphasis on shifting average economic and demographic conditions and calls really for leveling up or out. And, and much of the discussion in the US has involved really misusing terms like rural versus urban when they mean really declining urban versus um, yeah, metropolitan areas that, are, that, are, that are, have been reasonably successful and, and modern versus backward. So a lot of the discussion uses this kind of language. Uh, so the idea is that places are lagging behind or have fallen behind um, relative to uh, the, the, the more successful um, areas, which are overwhelmingly, of course, the, the metropolitan areas like New York, uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and so on. And I think both the UK 2019 election and Brexit, um, uh, you know, have been discussed both in terms of leveling up and the, and the collapse of Labour's so-called red wall. And in the US, uh, where Trump, uh, uh, Trump literally trumped Romney, this map here, and focused his economic policy for uh, from 2016 to 2020 on tariffs on Chinese imports designed to help the Midwestern region crucial to his election in 2016 and 2020. Remember the states that mattered at the end were Michigan, um, Pennsylvania, and, and Wisconsin. And, and these were the states that, that he tended to focus very heavily on. And, and his economic policy, his national economic policy was geared towards favoring these regions. So maybe we could kind of move on uh, uh, with the next uh, slide here. One of the things that lurks behind a lot of the discussion of, of leveling up is this obsession with reestablishing manufacturing, which reflects the fact that many of the declining areas or left behind areas were places that used to have uh, important he heavy industries of one kind or another, iron and steel, textiles of one sort or another, uh, things like that. And these are the industries that have gone into decline so lurking behind the leveling up agenda is it really something of an obsession with manufacturing. And this plays into nostalgia for times past. Uh, in the 1960s, manufacturing produced relatively high paying jobs for people with few educational credentials. And Trump uh, promised new coal mines, you may remember in, in, in his 2016 campaign. So bringing back the good old days is, is part of the refrain behind a lot of the discussion of, of leveling up across these uh, relatively supposedly homogenous regions. But how realistic is this under the current world economy? In the US, and we can move on now to the next slide, 
there's a county level correlation between decline in manufacturing employment and likelihood of unemployment. So there is an association here, which of course politicians have, have picked up on. And in the UK, declining employment in heavy industry is really central to the regional problem, which is on the next uh, slide. So you can see um, here, these are places with particular uh, industrial sectors uh, that, have, that have gone into serious decline really over a long period of time. I mean, not just over the last 40, 50 years, but say in some of these places going back to the 19. Uh, 30s uh, onwards. Uh, um, and so it's not just a recent phenomenon, this. But manufacturing employment has been declining across the industrialized world. The, the next slide shows this, that the prospects of, of improving, uh, you know, of getting more manufacturing employment don't look very good. I mean, the, okay, the UK and the US have maybe had larger relative declines in the percentage of, of total employment in manufacturing. But this isn't, this isn't gonna be something that's gonna uh, uh, suddenly go uh, skywards again after this long uh, period of decline. And the next, uh, the next graph after this shows us something about why. Um, and it's not really down just to the loss of jobs, you know, jobs going somewhere else, you know, to China or Mexico, or whatever the story is, but the substitution of technology for, uh, for employees, for labor, uh, substitution of capital for labor. So in the US, for example, here you can see there hasn't been a decline in manufacturing output at all. Yet, if you listen to a lot of the, the discourse uh, around manufacturing, you'd think the country didn't produce anything anymore and everything was being imported from somewhere else. Well, this just isn't true. Uh, what's happened is that there's been a dramatic reduction in manufacturing employment. And that's the problem. Um, but if you, if you start opening up factories and so on again, there's no guarantee that they're going to produce much employment at all, except for, you know, technicians are going to fix the equipment. So, so this is, so much of the US data then suggests that it's down to technology, not offshoring that's behind, been behind this. And output has gone up uh, as employment has gone down. So new manufacturing could bring back factories, but very few new jobs. I think that's the, the important point here. Okay, let's uh, move on now to the next thing. Well, one of the temptations, though, is to go for quick fixes, you know, to uh, attract some multinational company to, a, to an area which then promises, you know, all kinds of things, often in return for massive subsidies. This is what happened in Wisconsin in 2017, 2018. This is the title of a book published by the University of Chicago Press this year, um, Foxconn, Imaginary Jobs, Bulldozed Homes, and the Sacking of Local Government. I mean, it's essentially about promises made by the government uh, of, of Wisconsin to Foxconn, you know, the, the famous uh, contractor for Apple, uh, who, were, who were promising to uh, bring a, a, a large research and development um, operation to southern Wisconsin. And of course, uh, nothing of, of the sort has happened after huge subsidies. There are a number of offices that Foxconn has opened in, in Wisconsin, but nothing in terms of of, of, the, um, of what was originally uh, promised by the CEO of the company. And, and here you can see uh, the then uh, governor of Wisconsin and uh, President Trump um, uh, digging, uh, digging up dirt here, which was supposed to signify some huge new um, uh, innovative investment uh, in the declining Midwest of the United States. So this kind of quick fix often doesn't go anywhere. And, um, and, and this is what happened in this case. Um, Trump's tariffs though, we can go on to the next one, which he was doing at the same time, um, had the opposite effect of what he intended. So at the same time he was trying to attract this other investment, uh, there was an effort at, at trying to, um, you know, uh, based on the idea of protection, to, um, to protect the US economy by, in a sense, imposing high tariffs on certain uh, products, mainly from China, but also from the European Union and from Canada as well. Uh, but what happened was, if you look at this graph here, was that his tariffs undermined overall, overall manufacturing activity, because what he failed to note was that in fact, much of what was left of manufacturing activity in the Midwest and in other parts of the United States, and there's a lot of it as we've, as I already uh, suggested, was involved in producing parts and so on, 
that were then shipped to China to be turned into final products that were then sold in the United States and around the world. It was a, a sense that every that trade was just down to basic commodities and finished products, rather than that, in fact, global supply chains, uh, as in this case, uh, meant that people were being employed in the United States for making things that were finally assembled somewhere else. And so these tariffs had a, dr a dramatically negative effect on manufacturing employment and manufacturing activity in the United States over the period from uh, 2017 to 2019. So the problem then is that this, this doesn't deal with the central question, of course, which we're getting to, which is the importance of agglomeration economies in the contemporary world economy. As transport costs have gone down and even firm uh, factory scale economies of scale are less significant than they were, the thing that's been most important in driving particularly manufacturing activity have been agglomeration economies. Maybe we can move on to the next uh, uh, slide. You can see here 20 counties in the United States generated half of net new businesses in the US from 2010 to 14. And many of these were cluster, associated with clusters of specialized uh, firms of one kind or another. This is well known, of course, in, in regional studies. So new business formation in the, in the US then, um, uh, in a sense, mandates being close to firms that are doing very similar things to you. So how do you work against this? Well, you know, maybe we'll all end up doing remote work or something, but the, the prospects for that, I think, particularly when you're making things at least under current manufacturing conditions are, are fairly unlikely unless 3D printing uh, makes some kind of huge breakthrough very quickly. So the best strategy then is to build on historic clusters and extend these. I mean, the next slide has an example of this. Uh, for example, the, the motor vehicle industry in the United States, rather than just parachuting in, uh, as in the Foxconn case, trying to build on this kind of, uh, uh, some kind of industrial infrastructure that already exists. And this is the case here now with what you can call the US auto alley, which runs now from Michigan to Alabama. So most of the motor vehicle production in the United States now, with, with the exception of a little bit in California, is, uh, is, in this, is in this belt running from uh, right through the Midwest and into the South. Um, and particularly in terms of the uh, electrical uh, vehicle industry, this is where it's likely to be in the future. And so uh, the point here is to try and get linked into this, is to kind of um, uh, connect yourself to this. And this is what uh, has been happening, particularly in states like Tennessee and Alabama, connecting into, uh, uh, in a sense, expanding these kinds of clusters and taking advantage of, of your con connections uh, to already existing things. And by extension, the same thing, of course, would apply in the UK. I think I have a, a, a map uh, next uh, there. Now, this is just showing how concentrated in the US um, car making and vehicle investment is. Uh, so let's move on to the next one. So in, in, in the UK, we can look at the fact that there are similar kind of R&D intensity uh, levels across the country. And, and so what you try and do then is match up uh, where you already have some uh, advantage, some competitive advantage, and, and try and introduce new investment in, into, those, into those areas. Um, and, and George Freeman, I, if you're familiar with him, has finally sort of begun to discuss this, but uh, he's one of the few uh, people in Britain with any political connections that I've heard uh, discussing it however idealized uh, his, his discussion may actually be. But the Southeast of England, as we all know, will not have, uh, has advantages that will not be soon overtaken. I think we're all kind of aware of that. There's a very interesting paper that just came out in Economic Geography, and I want to have seen this by Nicola Law, Law and some of her colleagues at the University of North Carolina, um, which, which extends this kind of argument into how, uh, uh, declining in, uh, dis industrial districts like the North Carolina uh, textile district can in fact be revived by re-establishing connections with larger metropolitan areas, particularly with design companies, uh, marketing and distribution networks and so on that are located in, in, uh, in, in cities. And, and so uh, trying in a sense to take advantage of, uh, of modern uh, uh, communications uh, to in a sense revive uh, historic uh, historic industries, and, and I think that's uh, that's a good example. I think of of how um, of, of the way of the direction in which to go. Okay, moving moving on. 
Okay, this uh, this graph here shows, I think, the again the the importance of clustering or the importance of taking advantage of agglomeration economies. So being close to other firms in the same sector and all of the services that tend to be associated with them. So you can see here the advantages that the so-called greater Southeast still has over other parts of the country um, and that uh, will not soon be reversed. And of course the great danger with talking about leveling up is the danger of leveling down, which is that you, you end up punishing the places that have been reasonably successful uh, without necessarily then helping the places uh, that you're uh, trying to level up. Okay, uh, the next uh, thing. One of the, again, to get beyond the manufacturing obsession is also very important, I think, when we're talking about leveling up. If we're talking about getting people decent jobs and so on, we're trying to improve the prospects of places. Uh, the most important sector is, 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 is the service sector in terms of numbers of jobs. And in fact, increasingly uh, reasonably well-paying ones as well, if they're in business or producer services and so on. And we can see here, this is a map across the uh, uh, EU as it then was, uh, including uh, Britain in 2017, mm -hmm. showing tradable services employment. And, and obviously this is the lion's share of jobs in most, uh, in most places. And, and so the, the task here is, is not to forget about this sector, uh, with this obsession with manufacturing. Uh, the, next, uh, the next slide. And the same thing goes in the United States. The service sector, of course, is much more spread around. It includes all kinds of uh, personal consumer services on the one hand, as well as producer services. And the producer services tend to, uh, tend to give rise to much higher paying uh, jobs and, and, and higher employment uh, with uh, bigger multiplier effects and so on. But the, this is the sector in which uh, one might expect to see rather more emphasis. So everything from IT and communications to professional and technical services and trying to improve things. So how do you do this? Well, you do this, and this is where we come to the next section. You can't treat places as if they're in isolation from one another. You, you have to have some kind of national policy where you focus on really three things. Um, infrastructure, education, and research and development. And these, these are things to be done nationally or regionally, uh, but can't be done just in localities. You have to have policies that address all of them. One of the major problems across large parts of the United States is the absence of broadband, which some of us have discovered when we had students recently who we were trying to teach uh, who couldn't get reliable uh, Wi-Fi in the areas in which they lived. And, and this is rampant across the country. And so something like uh, increased uh, access to broadband, uh, improving uh, roads and, 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 and so on, and transportation infrastructure generally. And of course, this has now uh, become, uh, certainly in the US and to a degree in Britain, an important priority. And, it, and it's certainly one that deserves to be emphasized. But again, it, it's, it has to be a national scale kind of initiative. It can't be just done on a place by place or locality by pla locality, by locality uh, basis. Uh, next, in terms of education, we all know that this is, this is in fact one of the main problems. But in fact, uh, pools of people in different places with uh, lacking in any of the kinds of educational credentials that you, that you need to be attractive to any kind of business or any kind of employer, you know, irrespective of who owns that business or, or where it comes from. And this is a huge problem. What this uh, graph shows are, changes in real hourly earnings by education in the United States from 1979 to 2007. And, and overwhelmingly it's people who have no college education or no, uh, or dropped out of high school, who are the ones who in fact now are faced with the, with the toughest job market. All those old manufacturing jobs have disappeared and haven't been replaced by anything for which they're qualified. And this is a problem, particularly in the parts of the United States that we were just talking about. And again, it needs to be addressed uh, nationally by things like having policies to try and improve high school education, technical education, uh, apprenticeships, and so on. There was a very recent, uh, interesting article in the Financial Times recently by Peter Lample, I don't know whether anyone else saw that, arguing that in fact, uh, this was perhaps the most important part of a leveling up agenda in Britain, was addressing all these deficiencies in, in access to education, and the fact that many people who live in the poorer parts of Britain can't afford to go to university anymore because of the, of the cost of fees, of, of tuition. Um, and, uh, and that many of us, you know, in our day, of course, 
went with government grants and, and all of these things have disappeared. So these compensations that would help many of these regions are, are, are lacking and education is one of these. And then finally, research and development, uh, the next uh, graph. Uh, what this shows is that countries like Britain and, and even the United States have really lagged behind in terms of research and development expenditures from national governments. And, and, and again, you're not gonna get some magic uh, leveling up unless you put a lot more money into innovative uh, activities, into new product development, into, into um, new, new things that, uh, that, that, that people can, uh, can make. So these are, these are important imperatives. So finally then, let's uh, finish up because I think I'm over time here. We clearly have a regional problem. I mean, just to look at average weekly pay and things, I mean, endless indicators that we can look at across countries um, everywhere. There is a regional problem, but it's not just a regional problem. It's a local, national, and global as well as regional problem. Regions have to be put into, into these contexts. They have to be nested in, if you like, so to speak, into these other, uh, along with these other scales. It's a multi-scalar problem, and that's what I've been trying to draw attention to. The, the infrastructure education and, uh, and R&D have to be uh, concentrated at, at either supranational levels like that of the EU or at national level. They can't be just managed regionally, but then regionally you can have an emphasis on, on specialization, on trying to uh, focus on, on, on connecting up perhaps uh, historic traditions or heritage industries that you have within that particular region. Uh, but trying to benefit in some way from, from agglomeration economies. So the regional problem is simultaneously a local, regional, national, and a global one. And it's about how best to slip places into the global division of labor and not thinking that you can simply reproduce the good old days. The things were grim up north. Can we move on now to the next uh, slide? And so, so we can do the same thing you know, across the US as well as, as for as for Britain, uh, and this is in terms of changes in global trade and technology, of course, have shifted jobs and industries. But just to finish up, uh, my final image here, okay, uh, and a kind of a personal, ending on a personal note here, <laughs> we can't think we can simply reproduce the good old days. Things were grim up north back then too. This is the Millam Ironworks, uh, which is in a town near where I grew up in in uh, what then was West Cumberland, which is uh, Cumbria now. I can't remember when some places up there weren't left behind. I mean, I grew up, uh, we used to call it the back end of nowhere. And I come from one of these. This is the picture of the Millam Ironworks, which was demolished in 1968. And this is a town that, you know, was left behind then. And the promise then was to level up by introducing various uh, magical uh, uh, formulae like uh, having uh, uh, a uh, hovercraft co uh, company move in. Remember hovercraft? I mean, they, you know, something that came and went. Um, and that did last, it lasted about seven years. What's happened in, to Millam is an interesting story because today most of the people who live in Millam and its population actually hasn't shrunk very much. Um, amazingly, it's shrunk a bit. Uh, but most of those people now commute. They don't live there. They commute up the coast where they work for what used to be the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority, you know, which is uh, British nuclear fuels. <laughs> or they commute to Barrow and Furnace where they work in, in building uh, uh, submarines for the, for the British Navy. Uh, so lots of them are government employees now. So uh, again, people find ways of, uh, around industrial decline but only if there are these other nodes that are available for them to travel to. But people will also travel. And that's the story of, of Milan. Thank you.